whistleblowers get mixed reviews, do they not? If you point out abuse or illegal practices in the workplace, perhaps you will be rewarded and uh, appreciated for that effort, depending on who it is that is being accused and where you are in the food chain of that uh, corporation. But the truth is that siblings who make a practice of telling on each other can drive parents to distraction. And some of us have had that experience. So here, in Paul's letter to the quarrelsome Christian community in Corinth, it is Chloe who blows the whistle on those causing trouble and dividing this new fragile faith community that Paul is trying to establish. It's possible that Chloe is just a busybody, just someone who likes to stir things up, meddling in other people's business, making mountains out of mohills, perhaps. But also, perhaps, she is a reliable reporter of what really is going on in Corinth after Paul has left. Christian faith communities have always been fragile places where personalities and egos and personal agendas get played out in the front of an audience, sometimes a very willing audience. It seems that in that small Corinthian church, there are at least four competing groups, each vying for influence and finally for dominance. One owes its allegiance to Paul, who has founded that community and has quite a following as a result. There's another group that looks to Apollos. It was Apollos who took over the leadership of the Corinthian church when Paul left to continue his missionary journeys. Then there's a third group that claims its loyalty to Cephas or to Peter, the disciple, apostle, likely people in that community who came from Jewish background and therefore were kind of gravitating toward Peter. And then there's a fourth group that calls itself the Christ group, which sounds admirable at first, but more than likely this was a group of the true believers who had the right message and said Christ was obviously granting them the kind of recognition they deserved. So what had started out as this small, hopeful group of new Christians intent on following the teachings of Jesus had morphed into these competing and warring factions, each taking snipes at the other persons, each suspicious of the others. And Paul pleads with them, pleads with them to set aside their controversies, staying loyal to the crucified and risen Christ for that should unite them and minimize all of their differences. This is Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. We can assume that Paul's pleadings went unheeded, for there are fragments of three subsequent letters to the Corinthians, and each of them is talking to them, can't you get along? Will you please learn to love one another? Well, congregations like most uh, other communities are not cloned groups. We are not all the same peas that came from the same pod. Everyone here and in any kind of a group like this is a bundle of opinions and experiences and viewpoints shaped by a lifetime of events and attitudes and influences. I think we can all agree that the date today is January the 22nd in the year of our Lord, 2017. That may be the only thing that we all agree on as we come together, for we are diverse people and this is a diverse community. Christian communities tend to be passionate communities passionate about their beliefs and their practices. And when we are passionate about what we have come to believe, it follows that we would become advocates of whatever it is we believe, whatever we think ought to be done, 
and people ought to follow, and not too bashful about sharing our convictions. And that was the case in Corinth. I think it's the truth in every Christian community. There are a number of ways of judging a congregation, a church. A number of ways we can make comparisons between this expression of a church and another expression of a church, how one stacks up against the others. There are the usual ways that we put together an annual report. How many members do you have? How many people show up for worship? How big is your budget? What is the size of your debt if you have one? How many kids and youth are participating? How many paid or volunteer people are in your staff? Those kinds of statistics. And while those statistics may be interesting and even insightful, and even resemble the truth, I am proposing a different way of understanding a church. I think that every congregation, perhaps other groups as well, have what I would call a bubble of safe discourse. A, a, a bubble in which people can express their opinions openly because they will be acceptable and in which people can talk about issues safely because people would say that kind of fits what our group mindset is. The bubble is the range of ideas and opinions and topics of discussion that can safely be considered and said out loud. The bubble can be anywhere on the spectrum, and it may be different on the spectrum and according to different subject matter, but it's the range of acceptable conversation that can go on in the building. The insiders, that's us, we will know what is allowable within that bubble. And new folks, if they come, will soon learn. Either a new person coming into our bubble of safe discourse will conform to the group, agreeing to this range of ideas and opinions and fit in, or the person will challenge the bubble, say things that don't fit, and then maybe be cowered into silence or drift away because they see they do not belong. It is my belief that in most groups, and in fact in most congregations, the tendency is to conform. The tendency is to narrow the bubble, to block out ideas and opinions that don't nicely fit in for the sake of tranquility and getting along. And I believe that the measure of a church should be its commitment to widening and opening the bubble of safe discourse, to push out the sides. I believe it is healthy and faithful to invite into the conversation voices that are not usually heard, ideas that don't nicely fit, and opinions that may cause some of us to pause and think, well, where did that come from? Instead of just reinforcing what we already think we know, invite a viewpoint that strikes a new chord, maybe even a dissonant chord, one we haven't heard before. Instead of protecting the group against something different, encourage the new voice to speak from a new perspective and give that new voice an honest and respective hearing. Now there's an obvious downside to what I'm proposing and it was the problem of the Corinthian church. The people said I belong to Paul and I belong to Apollos and I belong to Cephas and I belong to Christ. Competing allegiances of people and viewpoints. And that often has spread disruptive powers in churches that are prone to trot out then our favorite scriptures and say that's my scripture and you can't compete with it 
or to try to back another person into a corner by saying, how in the world can you believe that? Let me tell you the truth, or those kinds of attitudes. When Paul pleads with them to be in agreement, that there be no division among them, that they ought to be united in the same mind and purpose, I don't think he was trying to browbeat them into kind of a sterile conformity. I think Paul was encouraging them to find a common center, to find a meeting place that would define them as Christians and would make that their central affirmation. If you go back to the beginning, to the early church, the first confession of faith, before we had all these long confessions of faith, the first confession of faith was just three words. Jesus is Lord. That was it. That got you in the front door. Jesus is Lord. Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth is Lord, is the primary loyalty of my life. That was a unifying confession that made them all Christians. Not their views on baptism or Holy Communion. Not their views on fasting or tithing or scripture or popular or proper behavior. And certainly not your understanding of the Trinity. That all came a lot later. And those are things we've been fighting about for a long time. Three words. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is at the very center of this bubble of discourse, safe discourse I'm talking about. Around that central affirmation, we can welcome diverse opinions. In fact, we ought to welcome diverse opinions about everything from the separation of church and state to public and private behaviors that are proper, interpretations of scripture, political allegiances and stances, economic theories, church structures and sacraments, and ways of people living out Christian discipleship. All that's up for discussion. The center is Jesus is Lord. The way into church, any church, this church, is that simple confession, Jesus is Lord. What we can invite from each other is how God's spirit has been alive and well in your life. Tell us about your journey. Tell us what you've learned. Tell us how it has affected the way you get up in the morning and treat people all day. What have you learned so far in your faith journey? What have you come to believe so far in your journey? Who is it that you are seeking to become as a child of God? You see, there ought to be enough room in every congregation, especially this one, for creationists and evolutionists, neither writing off the other. Enough room for Democrats and Republicans and independents and others of political persuasions. Differing views of how life begins and how life ends, all honored in the safe bubble of discourse. We ought to expectantly welcome the new folk, the new person who can offer a new set of experiences and new insights into our mix. We ought to be proud of who we are, but not so proud that we cannot learn from someone who comes late to our parade, but has a rightful place among us and enriches us by that person's presence. So the bottom line is uh, cherish who you have become, how God has led you and guided you, but also welcome the chance to be challenged by someone who will say it differently and have different experiences and come to faith by a different journey. Push back the tendency to be comfortable in what you already know, your satisfaction with the people you have already become and be intrigued with what is still out there and what God still might have in mind for you. Honor the bubble of safe discourse which already describes St. John United Church of Christ. 
but be willing to open new and differing voices and learnings from others and even from ourselves who find a new voice within ourselves that will deepen our faith and that will widen our community. So welcome the stranger. Welcome the new voice you haven't heard yet. And see the newness, not as threat, but as gift that leads to blessing. Hold fast to the center, Jesus is Lord, and know that the God who created the amazing diversity of this world invites us to be in wonder and in awe of each other and of what God still has in mind for us as individuals, and as a faith community. So be it. Amen.